Good afternoon, everyone. We actually have Hayden's mama on here talking about her uh, her legacy of Hayden. Welcome, welcome, Rebecca. Thank you very much for coming back to the show today. Hi, Brent. Thanks for having me back. I'd like to give you a little bit of the backstory with Hayden's. I was a young mom when I had Hayden. I was 23 years old and kind of around the six month mark, I started realizing that he doesn't have not hitting his milestones he doesn't have any muscle support or anything like that so we kind of started our journey on um, the special needs road that we've been on which has kind of involved every facet you can imagine under uh, disability needs so we've been kind of through it all it started really when he was little and we kind of were unheard by the doctor. I mean, I'm sure everyone that has a child or has disabilities themselves know how slow the process is getting anywhere with the doctor. They like to kind of go through everything first before they'll even send you to a pediatrician or a specialist. It really just started when Hayden was super young, but those were kind of the easy days uh, reflecting on, on the past. He had a lot of services. Um, he had a great center he could go to for physio and speech therapy and he went to JK there and it's kind of like the older he got the more we struggled within the system the more we struggled kind of with people listening to me um, people you know in the system with their egos kind of making judgments on you know what Hayden's needs were and I mean um, I'll just give a quick example Uh, he needed a new wheelchair and his school his bus and his mother all wanted a tilted wheelchair And they would not approve it because they met him for five minutes and decided it's not what he needed. So that was kind of like our experience growing, uh, growing older with Hayden. The older he got, yes, definitely the more challenging it became because I'm sure everyone knows as well that children are kind of more protected. And once you're an adult, you're kind of on your own. Um, So I'll just tell you a little bit about Hayden uh, in general. So Hayden was literally, I call him my hippie baby. He was so chill, so relaxed, so smiley, just literally the happiest child you could ever, ever have. He was completely dependent, nonverbal, but obviously he had his own style of communication. um, And he really had a personal relationship with everybody that was in his life, even though, again, he was completely dependent. He really had, you know, great bonds with people, his teachers, his, his family, his friends. Anyway, so basically what happened with Hayden is, as we all know, COVID hit and all of his services went on hold. He was pulled from school. I had to stop working. Um, Obviously, we had to go in complete lockdown because on top of having special needs, he was uh, also incredibly medically fragile. He picked up everything that, you know, came along his way. He had Cornelia de Leon syndrome and microcephaly as well as just global delays and all kinds of special needs, epilepsy and other issues on top of that. Basically what happened the last few years is we just kind of watched Hayden go down the tubes from lack of services and his medical needs becoming worse. He had scoliosis, which was also something that he needed to have treatment for, but with delays from COVID, he never even made it to the point where he could get an appointment. Um, And that was a huge contributing factor, sadly, to his death um, in January. As far as I'm concerned, I just really want to advocate for other people that are still in this position. I know there are so many others that are, and it's just horrifying what happened to Hayden. I know other people that are in similar positions that have just watched their children waste away, and we see it with adults all the time too, because, you know, basic basic services and needs that, that are not being met and then people just decline until the point that they can't recover anymore. Uh, basically, that's my focus now with Hayden's legacy is trying to fight for change so that you know other people don't have to live like this anymore because we did, and I have a very supportive family, very loving family. Uh, my dad was a special education teacher himself, so Hayden was really in a great family with tons of love and tons of support, and I just can't even imagine Um, not having that because we struggled tremendously even with that because just nothing is adequate in services for people with special needs but again as a child it was okay as an adult I was just horrified and the decline really happened super quickly when he was an adult a lot of it contributing factors from lack of services and you know 
for me as well, not having support, not having nursing, not having respite, not having funding for diet, not having really any access to anything. Hayden was clearly completely disabled. He was in a wheelchair, he was nonverbal, had to be fed the whole nine yards. And for us, it was a very long process getting ODSP, and we never even got around to getting our DSO funding, which is really what he needed the most. But basically, the paperwork was just, it was crazy. And I kept saying to my mom, because I think a lot of the time, she wonders what I do with my time, and I'm not sure she understands how many phone calls and how much paperwork I do on a regular basis, I'm just filling out government forms, etc. But it was very long. It was very jumble worded. I remember saying to my mom a few times, I said, I'm having a hard enough time understanding this and I'm pretty good at understanding government stuff. And I said, I couldn't imagine a new Canadian or somebody that doesn't have English as a first language or somebody, you know, that struggles with the way they word things in general. I thought, who who's going to help them do this? And I know that they are supposed to assign someone to help. But I mean, I think we all know how, you know, getting anything done in the system, how, how quickly it happens and how easily it happens. It doesn't. Um, yeah, that alone. And then when he had his DSO uh, meeting, it was a six hour meeting. And they told me we did it on Zoom. And they told me that, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, we would have had to drive to Oakville for these two appointments. And I mean, stuff like that is just ridiculous. They need to streamline the system for Hayden, he could have right, gone right into the adult system with minimal interference. He didn't really need to go through all of the processes again. And yeah, like I said, I just, I don't know how anyone can figure it out if they're on their own or not sure. And everyone's afraid to make a mistake because nobody wants the government coming back at them. Like there's a lot of pressure in doing government paperwork. And that's something that people that don't deal with it don't have to, they don't really understand because they've never had it be an issue for them before. But it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's so many there's so many inequalities in the system, and like there's so many cracks, and there it's just fragmented, and, and it needs oh, yeah. to be completely uh, overhauled, right? And it, it's the ones at the top that just don't they they just don't seem to get it. it it's you know no. it's, it's strictly it's completely ableism, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, and we need to educate them to make them understand that it's not okay the way the system is uh, is set right now. I I don't I I'm still baffled on. I mean, who's designed the system with once upon a time? Oh I mean, yes. And and another part of the problem is like uh, again with paperwork and fear of paperwork not doing things correctly. I mean, they also have a system where they basically send you a letter saying your benefits are cut off, and you usually find that out after you've missed a pay. And it's usually because they want paperwork and it's like they give you a ridiculous timeline. Oh, again, it's very ableist because it's like, well, just go copy it or just do this or just get a form from your doctor. And it's not always that easy to either leave the house or, you know, get a hold of your doctor or whatever. And I just find that very, I just find that one of the worst parts of the system that, I mean, for me, anytime I get government mail, my stomach drops and I just wonder, oh, what, what would you, they want now? You know, and that is very common, I'm sure, among anybody that has to deal with the government, that anything that comes in the mail from the government is something that you kind of panic about. And I mean, we shouldn't live in a system where you start freaking out because you got mail. So I have a friend, uh, a very close friend, and we have very similar children. They grew up together, had very similar needs. So we were going through this process together. I was ahead of her by one month, and then her son turned 18 as well. And just the misinformation within the system itself. I mean, her worker would tell her one thing, my worker would tell me another thing, and then we talk about it. We're like, but that's not what was said to me. And it seems like there's not even a clear policy within the system. And it depends who you talk to and what worker you have as to what happens with what your needs are. And I mean, that's not okay at all. If there are people that are listening that, you know, have a certain perception of disability, I mean, it is ridiculously hard to get on disability. I don't think people understand the, the, you know, the doctor's notes and the, the requirements to even apply for like ODSP or whatever your provincial system is. It's, it's just, it's, it's so difficult to get on. And then the, the government basically comes back and questions everything that your doctor has said that you require. And it's just, it, there's such a misperception of, of people abusing the system and people just getting what they want out of, out of whatever we get, whatever we give them, which is basically nothing a month. And it's like people have really fought to get those benefits. It's not like you can just go to apply for ODSP 
because you feel like it, you don't want to work anymore, and they just give it to you. Exactly, and and uh, I'm just going to elaborate on that part too. Is uh, doctors are in a profession where they don't, they won't put their uh, their career on the line to misdiagnose um, somebody to get uh, any uh, disability support uh, services in Ontario or anywhere in the country. They will put a person through uh, ring world testing, and they will determine their their your eligibility based on your disability, right? Um, and it, it is, I mean, a disability doesn't go away, right? So it's it diagnosed accordingly. And those people that are on are on. And it's not like a disability will go away all of a sudden. I, I know in certain provinces they try to uh, reassess people uh, once upon a time. I know in uh, in British Columbia they did that. They tried and it, it, they failed on it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, why why try to reassess a person and just to try to cover cut cost, right? Just to make it look good for the government. Uh, and I mean, it puts a, a person uh, with disability through you know PTSD, right? For sure. And uh, all a whole bunch of other uh, aspects and worry and then stress. Um, I mean, people already have enough of those issues to deal with in their life um, as a person with disability in Canada. I, I just wanted to say, too, I think we also need to look at disability uh, as, a, as a whole, too. I mean, there's so many people that are, are in different aspects of it, and there's also the whole caregiving aspect. I mean, I think I mentioned last time that I've run the daycare for the last 20 years because it's all I could do when I took care of Hayden. Uh, he'd be off, you know, 50, 60 days a year from school. So I'd basically have him, you know, half the year while I'm working. So I couldn't work a conventional job with benefits or anything like that. And it frustrates me that as soon as he turns 18, you know, I can pay somebody else to watch him, but I can't use the funding for myself or a spouse who, you know, has to be home to take care of him at the same time. And I just think we need to, you know, give people, give families a little bit more leeway and flexibility in determining what they do with their own funding. I mean, there's a lot of it that came for Hayden that I think I also mentioned last time that none of it applied to him. It's like there was only one thing in the whole realm of what you could use funding for that applied to him. And for someone like me, it's really frustrating when, we're struggling so much and we have this funding sitting here but we can't actually use it for anything i just think in general there just needs to be less bureaucracy and so much more on the ground talk about how how actual policies play out in the real world because like i said before intentions aren't always malicious right people try to do do what they think is best and but they just don't have the knowledge to do it and then played out as something else I think we just need to, yeah, burn burn the whole thing to the ground and start over again for a modern a modern age disability. A absolutely, I, I can totally agree with you on that, and everything needs to be completely re completely rehauled on that because uh, I mean nobody should have to worry about all the, the paperwork and all the red tape that goes with it, uh, a standard of living, and then some. <laughs>